My guest today is John Burns. How are you, John? Good. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. What do you do for a living, John? So by day, uh, let's talk about that first. Uh, I am right. I'm a senior staff platform engineer at Grubhub. Uh, I'm on Grubhub. Uh, Grubhub is a uh, company that uh, helps you order food online and get it delivered to you. Um, so Important service for hungry people. <laughs> yes, yes, it, yes, it is. Um, and uh, we're based uh, in Chicago, and that is where I live. Although we have teams uh, distributed and uh, in other cities as well. I actually didn't know that. So Grubhub's head, world headquarters are in Chicago? Yes, yes. We do have a parent company now that is based in Europe, but uh, we're still operate as an independent company mostly. And uh, we started here in Chicago and our headquarters was always here. Wow, uh, very cool. I, so. It's one minute into this call and I've already learned something. <laughs> yeah, I so learned we... something last time you spoke uh, at, uh, oh well, gosh, it was a combined meeting of the Chicago Kotlin user group, the Chicago Java user group, the go-to mm -hmm. conference folks, and even the mm -hmm. Pittsburgh <laughs> Java group was involved in that. Yes. And you spoke about uh, something called uh, platform engineering, which is yes. had something to do with DevOps, right? Yeah. So I'm on the platform engineering team at Grubhub. And uh, so we are a team that um, <clears throat> basically... Uh, Platform engineering is a practice that has developed in, a, in about the last 10 years, and it's an evolution of DevOps. So let's go back to uh, talk about what DevOps is first. Yeah, let's right? a quick definition. Um, DevOps uh, was the idea that um, developers, when they write software uh, and just kind of throw it over the wall at some ops team to run the code in production, is not a very good process, right? There's um, problems there, the operations people don't have the full context of what, how the software works. So it's hard for them to actually run that in production. Um, so DevOps tries to solve that by saying the dev team is responsible for operating the code in production. Um, and that is a good idea, right? It, it works really well. It solves yeah. a lot of those bottlenecks of like where you have a bunch of red tape before the ops team will deploy anything and stuff like that. Uh, you, can, you can ship your code fast, you can ship your code often, um, but there's some drawbacks to DevOps as well. And so um, while we solve the bottleneck of deploying your code to production um, by implementing things like CI and CD, um, we, we introduce some more bottlenecks, right? So now that your dev team is responsible for all of those things, now you have to have expertise in those things on your team to set that up, set up your CI pipeline, set up your CD pipeline, know how the software is actually deployed in production, uh, whether you're using like a public cloud or uh, some on-premise servers or whatever it happens to be, you have to know how to do that. And so that introduces those new bottlenecks. Platform engineering tries to address those. So the approach platform engineering takes is let's build a platform onto which these problems are already solved and you can plug into it, but you still own the process on your development team. So we, we're not deploying it for you. These are self-service tools that we are providing to the entire organization, all the teams. So you know, platform engineering emerges in uh, t uh, companies that are doing um, usually microservices and um, have you know a dozen or more different software development teams working in that environment. Um, What's because, that? Can you give me an example of a self-service tool? Um, so for example, um, if you decide that, say, Jenkins is going to be your standard CI tool, for example, okay. we use that. So, integration. Yep. <laughs> yes. Um, instead of having everyone go into the Jenkins and set up their own custom jobs for how they're going to build everything, right? You can build, you can use something called uh, Jenkins DSL, which is um, a library for Jenkins that allows you to define in code how your jobs should be constructed, kind of almost like an infrastructure as code type solution. And then you can apply at a platform level templates for that. So okay. if you if you have a template, stand template might be something like let's let's run our let's compile it and then run automated tests and then uh, move the code to the next stage something like that is that the idea? But which test to run would be up to you as as you implement it. Is that, right. You, that right. If you have like a standard build lifecycle 
Um, you have you have to have some kind of standard, right? That some kind of uh, interface there that you define that says, okay, the the your branch builds will run this script. Your uh, deploy builds or your, you know, your production builds will run this script, and then within your each code repository, you define your script. Right. So um, for a, us, for example, we're in the Java ecosystem. So uh, we're using Gradle as our standard build tool. And so platform engineering builds on top of this by saying, we are going to set up standard Jenkins builds. You still create the build from su yourself for your team that you need, but you're using templates. It's more like building blocks. Like we need a standard build for this service. We need a standard uh, deploy for this service. And here's some parameters you can tune depending on your needs, but um, those templates are pre-built. And then we also provide standard Gradle plugins for our build tool that um, will interface with those standard builds uh, in a way that like makes sense for your common conventions, but also allows extension and configuration for anything custom your service needs to do. Okay, so is this the idea that I have a lot of builds? I have, a lot, I have dozens of projects across my organization, maybe hundreds, and they're all doing when I when I build and deploy them, they're all doing pretty much the same thing. Yeah, and most I of the things to take are the same. That make that repeatable. Yes, but the key here is the the approach here is the golden path approach, which is we will give you a paved golden path, turnkey out of the box. It's going to just work. You want to write some code and run it in production. It's going to be very fast and painless process. But we, if you need to go off roading, if you have some custom things, some uh, certain services are. A little bit different. They have unique problems they're trying to solve. Um, we want to allow that. We're not trying to box you in. So right. it's about making the solution extensible and customizable. And for example, at, at Grubhub, we have about 170 microservices running okay. um, using this platform. And so, uh, yeah, like I said, if if you're just if you don't have that many services, like you have a handful of services or a handful of teams you're probably not going to get much benefit from this approach, right? Mm -hmm. But as, as your organization starts to scale, it becomes a multiplier because if we can reduce the amount of toil that it takes a team to like build a service and deploy it, um, even by like an hour a week, right? Across 20 or 30 teams, that is our, that's almost a full-time developer right. worth of time that you've saved. Right. So, um, it, it becomes like a magnified magnified as your organization grows. Hmm. Okay. I think it also reduces the friction of implementing DevOps, which, you know, some people have an issue with because it's, there's always the startup. Getting right. The learning curve, right? Like you take the expertise about how all that stuff works under the hood and you centralize that in your platform team and then expose a more easy to use developer experience to the rest of the organization. Right. Okay. But they're still in control. They still own that process and like how they tune it, what configurations right. they give it according to the interface that you define in your developer experience. I see. What do these templates look like? Are they YAML files? Are they um, um, what are they, binary the, things? So it's <laughs> it's a good question. I, I think that um, the core Jenkins DSL, what they, what they define, I think is groovy. It's a groovy DSL. So it's code. Um, it's code, but we have our own layer on top of that, like where we define our, our own templates with, uh, I think we're doing YAML now. Um, and so we have like code that takes the YAML and translates it to what it needs to do um, in Groovy under the hood. So, okay. so you're, you're doing this for Grubhub, or your team is. Yes. Um, is there anything that's like across industries? Are these templates available just if I, that I can pull off either buy or get from open source? Uh, well, there are some like platform engineering tools that have been made publicly available. Um, nothing that we've built, um, unfortunately, I, I, I'd have to say, but uh, I can, I can point to, um, Netflix, as an example of, they, they've been pretty liberal of what they've open sourced in terms of their tooling. Uh, and so I think, uh, now I don't remember, I, I don't remember uh, where this came from, but Spinnaker is a, a continuous delivery pipeline tool that is a, it, it was eventually open sourced. And also there's a company now around providing services for that. There is, 
uh, going back to Netflix, they open sourced a lot of their runtime libraries uh, that they provided. So it's not just build and, and deploy tooling, right? This is where we've gone beyond the scope of DevOps and said, we will provide libraries within your application that you can use to hook into the platform, right? If we have in a microservices platform, if we have shared services such as your message broker or um, discovery, um, these the, are or configuration server, right? These okay. are cross cutting concerns. You want a standard way to integrate to those platform elements without having to write that code from scratch. So that is another thing the platform team provides. Netflix has open sourced a lot of their stuff and some of it even got integrated into uh, what's called Spring Boot uh, Cloud or Spring, okay. this is just Spring Cloud. I think it's just called Spring Cloud. It's a suite of software in the Spring framework now, originally coming from Netflix, but uh, standardizing kind of some of the runtime library side of things. Uh, in platform engineering. I see. I guess what I'm getting at is that if somebody uh, that wants to start up platform engineering in their own organization, uh, what do they do? They, they, what's the starting point? Do they go to Netflix and start just bring these tools in? Do they develop it all themselves? I think. How I do think. You, the, how do you all get started? Right. So the the first the first point that you have to figure out is like actually the microservices platform, right? Okay. The, the how everything works first under the hood. That's, that's what you have to do, figure out first. So how are you going to deploy things in a standard way? For example, if you, if you need like hot, hot region failover, everything like that, like figuring out how that's going to work in a standard way and building that out. Now, these days, a lot of teams are just adopting Kubernetes, right? Um, as their standard way of deploying things. And they get a lot of this out of the box. When we started doing this 10 years ago, Kubernetes was not really around. So we had to okay. figure out this stuff for ourselves. But sure. So maybe it's Kubernetes today. If you're starting from scratch, you, you figure out how did you deploy with Kubernetes? Okay. So that means you're probably deploying Docker containers. So how are you going to build your Docker containers? You kind of figure out a standard first and then you implement it right for a service or two. And then you start looking at, okay, now what is the common code here? We can commonize, extract out and just tackle one problem at a time. So uh, I, I approach platform, uh, uh, like scope as a list of problems that we're solving and you can just pick one off at a time. And as you start to go, then you start looking at the holistic developer experience. Um, and, and that's like the next phase after platform engineering is thinking about developer experience holistically. Um, so to answer your question more directly, where do you start? You start at your deploy process, your CI process, uh, your build process, um, and your runtime libraries, uh, what, like, any microservices platform has some standard tooling, right? Like how are you capturing metrics? How are you capturing logs? How are you capturing, or how, how are you doing service discovery? Th those things have to be figured out for a microservices platform. Okay. Once, once you've decided on how those things will work, then you can start building just libraries and tooling around it to make it easier to interface with those for each individual service. Got it, okay. So if you've solved the problem for one service, then that's probably a good starting point because if you don't start to understand what the problem is, if you've solved it for two or three services, then you're starting to see what the patterns are. Right, right. Uh, but Chip's right away. Where, where, where does one go to learn more about platform engineering? So to learn more about platform engineering, I think uh, some of the places to go are Netflix. They have a great tech blog. Uh, and then... They've talked a lot about the stuff there. You can also go to some of the uh, work that Gradle has been doing around what's called developer productivity uh, as a practice. Uh, they have done a lot of kind of public facing talks and, and uh, publications about what they call developer productivity, but it, it is very related to platform engineering. Um, but platform engineering is a little bit more tied to the implementation of like a microservices platform, whereas the way they frame it is a little bit more generic. Like even if you're doing like a monolith, you Got could it. use some of like what Gradle calls developer productivity stuff. But a lot of the stuff regarding the builds tooling side of things, um, you can read about there. Okay. Um, yeah, there's also a... A blog post on this. Okay. Both from Gradle and from Netflix. Yep. And then there's also a platform engineering, um, like Slack, like a public Slack that you can join. Um, that I think it's run by, I don't remember the name of the company, unfortunately. Sorry. But it is run by a company that does like platform engineering kind of like consulting and services. Um, 
and product development. Um, and so they just kind of run this Slack as a uh, service to the platform engineering community because it is a growing field. They're trying to encourage that. So um, I can I can give you the link for that. You know, if you want okay. to put it yeah, in your thanks. in your in the comments or the notes. Uh, you mentioned that that you are uh, maintaining an open source project. Is that related to this topic? It is related because uh, so I I am uh, currently maintaining the KT Link Gradle uh, open source Gradle plugin. Uh, library and K, K, the K stands for Kotlin, I assume. Yes. So it, KT Lint is a tool that is uh, actually owned by Pinterest, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, that lints your Kotlin code. Like it's a linter. Um, the reason why it exists as an open source kind of independent library is because, uh, so uh, JetBrains who developed Kotlin, uh, the linter that they wrote is integrated into their tool, IntelliJ. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, running it on the command line is not really a use case they developed that for. But mm -hmm. when you have, you know, a local build running or a CI build running, you might want it on the command line. So independently, um, the KT Lint uh, tool was developed by, uh, by uh, some people at Pinterest. And uh, it's a great CLI tool for linting Kotlin code. But if you want to run it as part of your Gradle build, you know, it's not the ideal scenario where you're just like running this on the command line, right? There's, there's some things that Gradle can do if you have a tighter integration with it, uh, such as caching the results and, um, you know, acquiring the tool, downloading it, right? And, and making it available locally to your build, things like that. So uh, there's a Gradle plugin for doing that. And that was developed by someone named Jonathan Leishu, who is a fairly big name in the open source uh, JVM ecosystem world. And he does a lot of work, uh, security work these days around um, open source security vulnerabilities, CVEs, he reports and fixes them. So he <laughs> didn't have as much time to maintain this KT Link Gradle project that he had written. So I've kind of stepped in it's, it really um, is perfect niche for me because I have a lot of Gradle experience and a lot of Kotlin experience. and so. Uh, it made sense. So for the past year or so, I've been uh, working on that project, um, keeping it up to date, modern, improved. Um, so awesome. that's been the biggest uh, contribution I've made to open source. I've also contributed to about a dozen other popular libraries like Spring and Micrometer and um, uh, Google has Jib, uh, which builds images, uh, Docker images mm -hmm. for Java projects. Uh, I've contributed to many others, but this this has definitely been my biggest contribution. I've learned a lot. Uh, in, awesome. in, in how to maintain open source while doing it. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you feel is critical to this topic? Um, well, I don't necessarily, I don't think so. Um, I'm also, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it. I, I think you briefly mentioned it. I'm a organizer of the Chicago Kotlin user group. So if anyone watching this or listening to this is in Chicago, um, come by our Chicago Kotlin user group sometime. Uh, we meet oh, up yeah, we'll, I will put a link to <laughs> the, the group and I'll put a link to your open source project mm -hmm. in the show notes. Um, um, you meet monthly. Uh, where, do you, where do you usually meet? Is there a common location? No, we, we have a few different hosts that we bounce. You're nomads. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we don't have a, a, a true home, but uh, so it, it varies. But it, it's nice because um, a lot of companies who are interested in, in finding more Kotlin developers, you know, they host us and um, yeah. you know, make us aware of them, them aware of us. It's just good for everyone involved to be more uh, keyed into the network uh, because it's still, a f it's a lot more popular than it used to be Kotlin, sure. but it's it's uh, still a smaller, smaller community, right? So it, the in the mobile development space, I know it's, it's growing rapidly. It is. It, um, oh, I would say it's fairly well established now at this point on Android, okay. right? But on the backend development side, that is where it's the, a lot of growth is right now. I see. Um, which it's it's kind of invisible because like places will be like we're Java because it is it's JVM under the hood but when yeah. you actually look it's like well actually we're writing Kotlin these days like <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's kind of a, a sneaky sneaky way way it's growing <laughs> it's their little secret <laughs> <laughs> you caught us <laughs> awesome John well thank you so much for your time this has been educational for me I didn't really uh, know anything about uh, this topic before I saw you about a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and I'm happy you were here to share it with. Me and, and oh, I guess one more friends. one more thing is I will oh, yeah. I will be at Dev Nexus in Atlanta in a okay. in, in a few weeks time here. I'm um, giving a full length talk 
on the topic of uh, platform engineering and how to develop, uh, how to use it to deliver a great developer experience to your entire organization. So for anyone who might be at that conference, which is the largest JVM conference in the country now, now that Java 1 no longer is a thing, uh, then uh, definitely check me out there. Awesome. Um, but the, yeah, right. thank you for having me. This has been uh, very fun and uh, hopefully see you again soon. <laughs> Hope so. One of the most important things in open source software right now, is, I think, is to make the distinction between open source software that is sharing technology with friends and building a corporate commons. And I think both of those things have their place and are valid. But when discussing what OSS should or shouldn't be, I think we need to make that distinction and not conflate those things.